Good day. This is Health on the Hill. I'm Jackie Judd. The proposal from the Senate's so-called Gang of Six has injected some new life into efforts to raise the debt ceiling and settle on a package of spending cuts that would pass both chambers. President Obama's enthusiasm was evident at a surprise press room appearance on Tuesday, which also served as an opportunity for him to position Democrats as the party willing to compromise. We have a Democratic president and administration that is prepared to sign a tough package that includes both spending cuts, uh, modifications to Social Security, Medicaid, uh, and Medicare that would strengthen those systems and allow them to move forward and would include uh, a revenue component. If the framework the Gang of Six developed does move forward, what might it mean for Medicare and Medicaid? Here to help us answer that is Julie Rovner, health policy correspondent for National Public Radio. Welcome back, Julie. Nice to be here. There was some specificity and a lot of vagueness in the paperwork that came out from the Gang of Six. What do you divine by reading it? Well, once again, the, the Senate, uh, and of course, this is a group of senators, three Democrats, three Republicans, right. likes to do these things by saying, here, committees, you do it. So the one specific that we know is that it would repeal the Class Act. This was a piece of last year's health overhaul law that would set up a long-term care program um, that would actually start next year, or at least start collecting premiums next year. Um, you would have to uh, pay in five years before it would vest and, and start to, to pay out benefits. Um, this was sort of the, the last great proposal from the late sen Senator Edward Kennedy, who, because remember, Medicare doesn't really pay any long-term care expenses. Right. Medicaid, Medicaid pays long-term care expenses, but you have to divest yourself of basically everything you own to get it. So this was an idea to have the government have a self-paid long-term care plan. Now, this would not so cover... So how would it save money? Right. Well, uh, that's a good question, because the uh, the way this was set up is it wouldn't pay for nursing home care. This was the, the class, the, the CL part of the Class Act stood for community living. So this was to be care, basically in the home to keep people out of nursing homes. Um, and it would be supposedly a relatively modest premium that you would pay over your working years. It would be automatically deducted from your paycheck. Um, but it was written so that it, it could not have a draw on the Treasury, that premiums, it would be self-supporting. Um, and in fact, it was written specifically so that it could not become, you know, a lot of people who hated it said, oh, it's going to be a new entitlement because it wouldn't be self-supporting. And there were worries about that. But and everything so is this is this an inducement? to some re re reluctant Republicans to come on board with this? That's why, that's what I'm looking at it. I don't think it's a budget saver per se. I don't think it will, it will, the CBO will look at this and say it will save X amount of dollars mm -hmm. because I don't think the, the CBO ever looked at it and said it will cost X amount of dollars. There were, as I mentioned, a lot of concerns that whether or not it would pay for itself, right. but I don't think it ever was scored as having a draw on the Treasury. On the other hand, it, a lot of Republicans and some Democrats really had major doubts about this. So its repeal, I think, would be an attraction to gain some Republican vote saying, see, we've taken a piece away from this health law that we really didn't like. Now, the larger piece, of course, is there is a suggestion to cut $500 billion um, to get that from health savings, but uh, not a lot of specificity. That's right. And in fact, the way you get to that number is that one of the things it says is that you will fix the physician fee problem. The doc fix. The doc fix. That's right. The, that we've spent so much time at this table <laughs> right. talking about. You will take away this 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 continuing, you know, sort of Damocles hanging over the head of the nation's doctors who serve Medicare patients. Um, now they're looking at a 25 percent cut that will start next January 1st to make that problem go away, to solve the formula problem that's been going on basically since 1997, but has been threatening cuts since 2001, cuts, I might add, that have never taken effect with the exception of one year. To fix that whole thing and start over again fresh cost about $300 billion. Which still leaves them $200 billion short. That's right. Well, no, to, then they, what it says is fix that problem and pay right. for it. So that's $300 billion. Right. Then it also says you will come up with $200 billion in other health care savings. Right. And it says to the Finance Committee you will do that. So those two things together are about $500 billion. That 
interestingly, is about how much they cut out of Medicare when they were doing the, the uh, Affordable Care Act last year. So it's another $500 billion in Medicare savings that they would have to find within six months. That's a lot of money. I mean, take, finding $500 billion in, in Medicare reductions was a big push. And they got the providers to go along with it because in the Affordable Care Act because they knew, the providers knew that they'd be getting a lot of more people with insurance. Um, so there was an enticement for them. They were getting something in return. Now it's just another $500 billion in reductions. That's not going to be a big and, enticement. And you mentioned that's a lot to do in six months. Yes, it is. The, the, the debt ceiling, if it's going to be resolved, needs to be done by August 2nd or before. So is the idea that's emerging that there could be a short-term agreement on raising the debt ceiling and everything else that the Gang of Six is proposing, this framework, would be dealt with in the coming months. That's Well, that's what this deal says that the, obviously the president has endorsed. And then just today, the president's spokesman, Jay mm -hmm. Carney, suggested that the president, who has heretofore said he would not sign any short-term extension of the debt limit, has suggested that if there is an agreement on this package, because remember, even getting this package together in time to get it through the House, get it through the Senate, and get it to the president, is probably going to take more than just the you know week and a half we have left. Um, so th now he's saying that the president might sign a short-term uh, debt ceiling extension for the, the time it would take to, I think, get this through. But I don't think it would be perhaps for those six months that, that so we're talking about And so it would kind of be the through. honor system that, that six months from now, <laughs> these serious cuts would in some form be enacted? Well, that's the way this is written. Okay. okay. And of course, it would, you know, it would have to go through the House, too. Yes, yes. Whatever happens in the next six, six months or so, it seems to me that there possibly has been a change in the political dialogue. When you have Democrats, when you have the President of the United States, a Democrat himself, talking about modifications, cuts, whatever word you want to use, to Medicaid and Medicare seems fairly remarkable. It does. Well, you know, but these none of this has happened yet. Remember, it will be, it's a huge give for the Republicans for their base to talk about revenues. And remember, there's supposedly, uh, I think, uh, uh, a trillion dollars of revenues in this package. There's a lot of mo there's a lot of money in revenues in this package, yep. Yep. Um, and to have Democrats who have really been kind of going to to political town on the Medicare cuts that were proposed by the Republicans, particularly the House Republicans in House Budget Committee Chairman Paul Ryan's budget. So to, Democrats don't want to give up that advantage they have on Medicare. Republicans don't want to give up the advantage they have on no uh, no increases in revenues. So to have either side come back towards the middle on that is a big give. And that's been the standoff all the way along. Then again, you know, as we've talked about many times, there are revenues and revenues. You can get tax rate increases mm -hmm. or you can close loopholes. Same thing is true with Medicare and Medicaid. You can have cuts and you can have that, that truly affect beneficiaries. You can raise premiums, you can raise co-payments, you can raise the age of eligibility, or you can make, you can do things that simply make the program more efficient, or you can nick providers but not cut them so much that they'll stop serving patients. You can do things to, to reduce the amount of spending that the program does without actually impacting in a negative way the people that it serves. So you can reduce the amount that Medicare spends without necessarily hurting the people that it serves. Not so easy, but possible. Well, we will still have to wait to find out from that menu you just laid out what Congress and the President choose. Thank you so much, Julie Rovner of National Public Radio. You're welcome.